How's it going, everyone? I'm sorry to hear about that. K Jewelers here, and welcome to my Ionios size spoiler video on Xenoblade Chronicles 3. If you are still in progress or haven't played the game yet, this is your warning to click off and come back later once you have finished the main story. However, I did release a spoiler free review of the game as a companion piece to this one that you can check out instead. There are going to be some aspects like gameplay and presentation that I won't cover so much in this video, so I do recommend watching that video before this one. Finally, if you do enjoy hearing my thoughts, then likes are always appreciated, and consider subscribing to the channel if you want to see more Xenoblade free content. Anyways, let's get to it. Before I jump into the core of this review that is composed of story elements, I briefly wanted to give some added context to what I said about Xenoblade Chronicles 3's music and locations. I maintain my stance that Xenoblade Chronicles 3's soundtrack is impeccable, but I refrained from mentioning too many specific songs due to spoilers. So, let's fix that. The Mobius battle theme is a great action piece that has numerous variations and really nails the intensity of fighting these terrifying monsters. In particular, I love M's version of this theme. Although Dana Desert could have deviated from its tornado design wise to be more intimidating, the music certainly plays that role marvelously. The infiltration theme for Kevis Castle sounds like something pulled from a Zelda game, and might legitimately be the scariest song in the series, and heavily played up my feelings of uneasiness as I speculated on what could have possibly happened to Melia to make her this way. Arafia C is majestic, and this particular part just makes me incredibly happy. As for the city, its theme feels like Masuda just strolled into Yokotaro and Keiichi Okabe's offices and stole this song plan for the next Nier title. And just to wrap this up, because we'd be here all day otherwise, Console N's first phase theme is a standout, and perfectly representative of a crumbling husk of a man with seemingly nothing left to lose. So if you couldn't tell, I really like this soundtrack, and I even forgot to mention how much I love Melia and Nia's themes. Melia using a remix of Aerif C for her quieter theme, and Future Connected's battle theme for her hero theme, is wonderful. Don't even get me started on Nia. When I first heard that small section of Drifting Soul when I opened the Sky Keep, pure magic. And her battle theme remix of it might even be better. I'm not even kidding, it almost got me tearing up hearing that. It was exactly what I would have wanted from a Smash remix of this song. Anyways, back to Pass K. This is just a selection of some excellent songs in addition to the ones I listed previously liking in You Will Know Our Name's Finale, Chain Attack, The Way to Life, and it does what I love about all the previous Xenoblade soundtracks by offering a wide array of calm and energetic songs with different instrumentations. There are some area themes that do lack the presence of those from previous games, but overall this soundtrack is really top of the line. Furthermore, the locations serve as a delightful background to some of these tunes, bolstering their atmospheric qualities. I held off naming some of these directly because there are people out there that might want to discover the combinations of previous locations based on the names as they experience the game, but I really resonated with Macfa Wildwoods with its extremely interesting vertical based method of exploration, Rivy Flats had this freshwater biome energy as you ascended a region built into a cliffside, and Arafia Sea might be one of my favorite locations in the series due to its sheer size and how it really sells this adventurous vibe with the day and night cycle occurring frequently as you dock on the beaches of numerous islands. 
Admittedly, I think the boat controls are a bit rough to say the least, especially with how wide the turns have to be, but I still enjoyed the different method of transportation offered. I don't think there was any location that left my jaw on the grounds like Valk Mountain from Xenoblade Chronicles or Morifa from Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but I also believe that comes down to the lack of spotlight put on these locations, as I alluded to, and Monolith Soft's decision to turn down the light show. There aren't many locations in this game that light up at nighttime as spectacularly as the series pass, at least not on the main path that I saw. When it comes to Xenoblade Chronicles 3, the story is the topic I have the most to talk about, and likely what you're most interested in hearing. Like I've stated, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 has a solid overall narrative that is carried by an incredible premise and themes. Placing the player behind the eyes of characters with merely 10 years to live is hollowing, and extremely concerning with regards to Mio who only has 3 months until her expiration date. Quick side note, but Ethel has a line where she says it'll take about 2 months to reach the city at Sword March, which is great for building a sense of tension in the player and for establishing the utter scale of Ionios. I really like that. What's also nice is just seeing how these characters start to unravel the secrets of the world and this 10 year time limit as the journey continues. These characters are plain marvelous and I absolutely adore how each member feels as if they have something to talk about with all the other different members of the party. When the group is walking down a path in the higher Ribby Flats region, Lance and Tyon have a conversation where you feel Lance really gets an understanding of who Tyon is, and then later says that he trusts whatever decision Tyon makes as an escape plan because Lance can tell he has insecurities about making the wrong decisions and explains why he is so concerned with optimization. I love that stuff and it makes it so there's not a member of the group who is left out of the equation. Their writing is also fantastic and filled with great characterization that bleeds into the well-constructed side quests. If you were to look at a lot of people's spots on this game, they're likely going to jump immediately to the characters because of their charismatic presence. What comes with them are a lot of genuine moments I adore, like the party seeing a baby for the first time, or trying to process Ethel and Kamaravi's duel, both events that play heavily into the game's themes of humanism and finding purpose in life. Also. Tyon's reactions are just adorable. Let, let me have a turn. <laughs> However, despite these characters likely acting as what is going to be the golden standard for a lot of people, personally, I found some of these characters take more time to hit their stride than others, and that was no more apparent than with our lead protagonist. In my first review, I said that Noah was a character I found pretty dry at first. Yes, he has a unique perspective on the world given his role as an offseer, and he's just a stand-up guy overall with some cute moments, but he doesn't have these big emotional peaks, and a lot of his characteristics are a lot more subtle than Shulk and Rex, which from an initial perspective, made me not as interested in him. Then, N steps into the picture, and his character becomes significantly more interesting. Not only because N acts as a dark reflection of Noah's character, therefore giving Noah development through his own actions, as well as how he impacts his alter ego? Bro, how do I even word this? But also because of how N forces Noah to react to certain situations. Chapter 5 has been the talk of the town with regards to this game, and yeah, yeah, I can see it. Emotional limits are shattered with the imprisonment of the party, the slow nature of Mio's non-violent execution in front of a crowd of people that know none the wiser is extraordinarily brutal. And this shot. Oh my god. The end of chapter 5 may be the single section that's affected the most people, but the intro to chapter 6 currently stands as my favorite moment in the entire game, and it's because of N. Just let this moment sink in. So, the one who died is... Why, Mio? Why would you do this to me? You said you'd be by my side. Mio! All I did, I did for you. The music, the phenomenal voice work, the labored, unsteady animation. Oh my god, it's so good. Hey, hey, where are you going? You forgot this. I mentioned that there was one villain in this game that met the high bar for Xenoblade's more prominent villains, and if you couldn't tell, that was N. 
His actions in the past and present are absolutely horrendous, malicious, and there's little justification to the path he chose. But I can't help feeling a bit of sympathy because of how he was manipulated by Zed, not just by words, but by the ceaseless failures in the world's never-ending cycle. I also appreciate how Noah even admits that he very well could have made the same mistake that N did, but he won't now that he has a strong support system and has grown as a person. N and Noah form a great dynamic, which unfortunately calls to attention my first issue with Xenoblade Chronicles Freeze narrative, the poor utilization and presence of the villains. The consoles are the most plentiful, and they have sick designs in their armor and as Mobius, but a majority of them feel half-baked or lacking some form of charm. That's why I refer to them as decorated roadblocks, and the only exceptions to this for me were Chris, Dirk, and Yorin, which were C, D, and J respectively. Chris feels like the most in control console, and his relationship to Noah makes him pretty intriguing. Dirk is just Mumcar 2.0 with the scruffy goatee, Wolverine claws, and deranged tendencies, but he just felt criminally underutilized. When he appears, I think he can be a lot of fun, especially in his introductory cutscene where he's lounging around and continually taunting them. But the toxic connection he establishes with Yuni is nowhere near as interesting to me as Dumban and Mumcar's, in addition to lacking that same consistent charisma. If he was given more screen time and they continued to develop how he traumatized Yuni, as well as carried that same energy from his introduction, he very well could have been my favorite villain from this game. Finally, while I don't love Yorin, I think his stance makes sense, and I do appreciate how he influences Lance's character just by existing. Yet, that's the reason I'm not head over heels for him, since a successful character in my eyes should be able to both influence and charm on their own. And although the consoles contain the side quests are supposed to play a less significant role, these sentiments do creep into how they are utilized for me. That's the general opinion I came to with the consoles. Their specific characters aren't all that interesting, and they're your stand user of the week, but honestly less interesting than even some of those. This man is an Italian chef who cooks food that cures your ailment through terrifying body horror. That is amazing. My preference for making smaller characters memorable is to go big or go home. Give them a sick fight moment or exaggerate their personality or body language. What I will say is that what the consoles represent is absolutely fantastic as it builds towards the revelation that Mobius is a byproduct of the people. K doesn't want to die. D wants to continue living a quiet life. Harvesting heads? That's mildly concerning. N wants to hold on to a loved one. These brilliant concepts on their own unfortunately never get the proper chance to shine because the time dedicated to these characters is split between so many consoles. One for each letter of the alphabet with the exception of A. Hell, the penultimate bosses console Y and X don't even get the privilege of death cutscenes. Man, that's just... cold. Even if we only take a look at the main villains, there's a large disconnect between them all. Technically, they all work for Zed, but he doesn't have any meaningful interactions with any of them outside of N. There's a lack of unity because of how these characters are written to embody a personal desire, and their only shared motive is to keep the world balanced. One might be curious how I can love someone like Mumkar as a villain who epitomizes a lot of what I just said by shying away from his faction's goals for personal endeavors. And that just comes down to his higher screen presence, more fun personality I resonate with, and connection to the party. And the reason that N stands out from his peers is because of that attention and care given to him. These utilization concerns are no more apparent than in Zed, who, again, I really like what they epitomize and their manipulative tendencies, but I think they're the most boring final boss in all of the Blade games. Don't get me wrong, the concept is great, the fight is a spectacle, but the physical character himself is lackluster. This ultimately impacts the game's finale because I don't feel compelled enough to take him down outside of wanting to complete the story. Speaking of the finale, my second gripe with this game was a lack of investment and weight on my behalf in the final chapters, which I believe came from a lack of a major endgame twist. The biggest instance was likely the reveal about Noah and N, as well as Mio and M's connections, or the fact that the latter two swap places, but that feels like it occupies the spot of your Prison Island or Spirit Crucible Elpis twist, where it should serve as setup for that grand reveal in the final hours. Perhaps the reveal of what Mobius truly is, or how the world came to be, were supposed to fill that slot, but a good portion of the origins was based on information that, again, was pretty inferred from the box art. Does a story need a huge twist to be good? No, certainly not. 
but I feel like that's a consistent component of these games, where it makes the player curious to go back and search for the hidden clues that these titles have been so good about providing. Hell, Xenogears also does this phenomenally, so it's not just the Blade series. It's hard to put my finger on it. The final two chapters felt serviceable, but they also felt like they were missing some star power. Normally within the series, events and speculation are running rampant in the final hours because of the mystique they employ. And I think some element like that would have made the final stretch of Xenoblade Chronicles 3's narrative feel more like the official third act. Truth be told, I think another Xeno staple I truly missed was the heavy religious influence. This has been the basis for the thematic and lore development in previous titles, and I think it makes the world more interesting to dive into and research. There are some elements like the lost numbers in Noah, but it's certainly less prominent and on the nose this time around. So, to sum up my general thoughts on the story, Fantastic premise with some excellent chapters I find decline after the beginning of chapter 6 when villains and large plot points aren't fully explored. I'd describe the final chapters like they had a list of character arcs and moments they wanted to hit, but they didn't know how to transition between them nor fully flesh them out at times. And as problematic as he is, I really do like N as a villain, and listen, I can already see you in the comments right now. Yeah, don't think you're slick. You're typing, K. Xenoblade 3 is just Xenogears again. Takahashi is simply reimagining the story in the context of Xenoblade so he can finally complete the six-part story of Perfect Works. And I'm here to tell you that you're not thinking deep enough. Xenoblade 3 is actually just Link's Awakening. I'm about to spoil this Game Boy Color game to shreds, so if you don't want to see any spoilers, go to this time frame. Let me give you a description, all right? Male lead character who plays a mystical woodwind instrument travels across an illusory world constructed from elements and creatures of worlds from that character's reality the player has previously seen in order to defeat the evil entity holding the character in a state of stasis. But doing so will also erase the illusory world the players come to love and become separated from the people they've come to know, including the love interest who also has musical talents. Oh, and just like Link's Awakening doesn't have Zelda actually appear, this is the first game to not feature the Xenoblade as in the Monados, which have occupied the role previously. The fifth chapter is water themed just like the fifth dungeon, and the game ends with the main character here in a melody associated with their love interest. And you're trying to tell me it's simply Xenogears when there isn't a single dolphin man in this game. Yeah, yeah okay, sure, you can chill over there with your level one thinking. While I'm over here, big brain at level five thinking. Listen, if we can remake the original Star Fox three times, who's telling me we can't do the same for Link's Awakening, huh? This shit is I apologize. I lost my train of thought. Got carried away. No, but seriously, it's just Xenogears. I know I've just put a spoiler warning for Link's Awakening, but I'm also going to be talking about Xenogears here, so if you'd like to not be spoiled on this incredible story, here's the timestamp to skip to. So Noah and Mio are essentially this game's interpretations of Faye and Ellie, respectively. Two lovers bound together by fate, but remixed and injected with qualities of a toxic relationship as a result of N, who holds some connection to id, but also Graph? It's admittedly a hodgepodge with N merging his consciousness with Noah just like id resigns to do near Xenogear's conclusion, and N being a past version of Noah who fell down a dark path in heartbreak, which led to the death of countless individuals just like with Lacan. Faze Ouroboros resembles Weltall. The nations of Kevis and Agnes at war being fueled by an outside party is very similar to Kislev and Ave's feud being stirred on by Solaris. There's a ton to compare. Overall, I do like how some of these elements were adapted within the context of the story, but I do believe that Xenogears handles these story beats much more effectively. It feels a bit dirty to make this direct comparison and use that as a means of evaluation, but I think it's warranted given how much of Xenogears' DNA matches Xenoblade Chronicles 3's. Now, I only recently reached Xenogears finale, but I honestly think it might be my personal favorite Xeno narrative, and a lot of that comes down to Faye and Ellie. Their relationship feels so genuine, where they've grown from enemies on different sides of the war to people deeply in love. This is standard fare, but what makes it so beautiful in my eyes is how neither of these characters feel as if their character is dependent on the other. They have their own personal struggles, their own dreams, but they're drawn together and eventually conclude that they need each other. Not as a crutch to keep them up, but because they love each other. 
I think Noah and Mio have a nice relationship filled with some genuine moments like their conversation in the Magfa Wildwoods, or cute situations like when they get super flustered seeing people kiss. I love these moments, and I'm also extremely happy that we got a real, non-CPR kiss between the leads of a Xenoblade game because it feels like a nice step into making these characters feel like they're in love. And I think there's a level of romantic maturity in that decision, which Xenogears made me realize that the Xenoblade titles could use a little bit more of. The overall point I'm getting toward is that Noah and Mio's relationship, which takes inspiration from my favorite element of Xenogears, is really wholesome and a good sign for the series' future romantic endeavors. But I think it feels less like a central developed arc than in Xenogears, which is why it didn't fully capture that same magic for me. But what did match that magic was the ending, which I think is beautifully bittersweet. There's something about Noah throwing away his red sword, which might be a further indication that the Klaus saga has ended and appear into where the series is heading. Then you have the character saying goodbye. Good lord, I can't properly explain how much I love all of these, from Tyon trying to climb the ranks of Uni's friends list, to Lance and Senna's fist bump, to Noah and Mio's kiss. God, I, I think it's perfect. Then you get the visuals of them running towards each other as the worlds move apart. Guys, I just... I need to do a video on this conclusion. It puts this big dumb grin on my face as I'm re-watching this and listening to the song Where We Belong sang by the talented Sarawita. I'm curious if Where We Belong is thematically related to where we used to be from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 since one starts the game and the other ends it. Regardless, it's a hard pill to swallow knowing that they're gonna be separated, but there's a glimmer of hope that they'll meet again one day as implied by the tune of Mio's flute. I know that the dreamlike, alternate timeline setting might make the events of this game feel as if they were nothing to people, but I've never had an issue with this premise if it's executed correctly. The characters still seem to hold memories of what they experienced, even if it's not a perfect recollection. And after experiencing so much pain for millennia, it just brings some relief to see them escape that never-ending cycle. Of course, we get the small references to the party of old. I was overcome with happiness seeing Melia reveal the Monado Rex and saying thank you everyone, for giving her the strength to keep going. That hit me deep. We then cut over to the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 side of things, where my sheer joy over seeing Poppy was immediately interrupted by what I would describe as the most shocking thing this game has to offer. I saw this image in the replies to something on Twitter and didn't even consider it to be a spoiler for Xenoblade 3 because I thought it was just some fan art someone made. The one thing I was spoiled on for this game, I didn't even realize I was spoiled on because I thought it was simply a shitpost. This revelation honestly had me so distracted that I was struggling to focus on the rest of the ending. They really took that line from the Spear Crucible Elpis and said, No, he literally meant that. I don't think there's a better word to describe this than goofy. And this might legitimately be the goofiest shit in the entire Blade series. Like, I'm still in disbelief. My man really took a page from the book of Nick Cannon and said, I'm having these kids on purpose. I don't have no accident. Okay, let me get back on track. Despite my infatuation with this ending, I do have some issues with what this game represents. Takahashi has confirmed that Xenoblade Chronicles 3 marks what is essentially the end of the Klaus saga, and if that's the case, I don't 100% feel it does that. Some of those elements of symbolism like Noah throwing the sword and the overarching idea of the world coming to harmony and making right the wrong of Klaus' experiment certainly fit the bill. However, we've done that before. While Klaus didn't need to play an important role or even appear, I think some mention of him or acknowledging how Origin and the state of the two worlds were a result of him would have helped make this game feel better connected narratively. While I absolutely love this as a conclusion for the game that is Xenoblade Chronicles 3, it doesn't feel like a satisfactory conclusion to an entire trilogy. It feels like the basis is there with the connected worlds, but I would have liked to have seen them gone a little bit farther, and I think this game's story is also impacted by a lack of explanation into some of these events or powers that shape the world, such as Mobius and Ouroboros. Mobius is said to be representative of the people's fears and hesitation, which is an awesome concept. So it makes sense why these reservations would be at their peak near the merging, but why did the feelings of people take up a physical form in Mobius? Ouroboros is bestowed upon people by the stones, but how did it originally come to life? Was it man-made or another byproduct of the people? These are pretty massive central tenets of the story which aren't fully dove into and I believe should have been. 
I don't think every element in a narrative needs to be explained, as that leaves room for lore and what I do here, which is analyzing different aspects of games. Yet when these vague elements are core to the narrative, that's when it can become problematic. These very well could be addressed in the upcoming story DLC next year, as a tale on the original Ouroboros founder seems very likely and would be sick. But as it currently stands, these vague plot elements in conjunction with the weak villains are why I personally classify Xenoblade Chronicles 3 as the weakest story of the numbered Blade games. I think that's about as good of a close as I can get to the story section, so let's wrap this up. Between these two review videos, I feel like I've spent a lot of time discussing Xenoblade Chronicles 3, and there's bound to be plenty of points I made that you agree with, but very likely disagree with as well. And perhaps comparing elements from other Xeno titles to Xenoblade Chronicles 3 is something you'd view as unfair, since this game is attempting to do its own thing. And I can understand that logic. I just wanted to lay out my current thoughts as honestly as possible. And I'm content with that. If you loved aspects of this game that I wasn't particularly too keen on, please do not let me take that away from you. There is always the chance that my opinion on a lot of these variables does change as I dive deeper into the content and learn more about it. I'm very interested to hear what you guys thought of this conclusion to the Klaus Saga, so leave your thoughts down below and I'll be sure to read through them. I just started working again a few weeks ago, so video production is going to slow down a bit. However, you can expect some more Xenoblade Chronicles free videos coming up in the pipeline as there are plenty of elements I want to discuss and analyze still, some of which I likely touched upon in this video. Anyways, I have rambled enough, thank you all for watching, and the continued support, and until next time.